Hi, I'm Gabrielle Haston. And I'm Heather Chant. And today we're going to talk to you about how music influences the brain. Uh, music can influence you in many, many positive ways, but even the music that you listen to can influence your mental and emotional state in positive and negative ways. Music is such a powerful tool that it's actually been shown to uh, slow down or even reverse the effects of some diseases such as Alzheimer's. Which is pretty fascinating. Um, and from an article from the University of Central Florida, which we're going to share in the link, um, it has this wonderful quote in it talking about how in the late stages of Alzheimer's, patients are typically unresponsive. Um, but then the doctor goes on to say, once you put the headphones that play their favorite music, their eyes will light up and they start moving and sometimes will even sing. The, um, and it says the effects maybe uh, can last up to 10 minutes or so after you turn off the music. And these are people that have, you know, truly by this stage are unresponsive um, you, to talk and even to touch sometimes, but they hear something from their childhood or from, you know, a significant time in their life and, and it perks that up. And so there's a wonderful video about a gentleman named Henry uh, that we have, a, we'll link in the bottom. Um, and so he was in the nursing home and they turned on music uh, from probably his young adult life. And getting to hear that really made such a beautiful um, reaction. Uh, so one of the reasons why we wanted to talk about this right now is we're under a lot of stress right now. And I wanted to bring awareness to people, we did, um, not just on how music works with your brain, but why would that be important to talk about right now specifically? Because everyone's got a lot of stress and anxiety and unknowns, and this is going to be a great way to talk about scientifically how music affects your brain but what can you do or maybe what are you doing to encourage good healthy brain function and activities during all this so we're going to start first of all by talking about some of the ways that the brain is set up to respond to music over here on our screen you can see the different areas of the brain we're going to each highlight two areas of the brain um, and talk about why this part of the brain is important. Um, the first area is called Broca's area, and this is an area of the brain that enables us to produce speech. So a lot of times um, stroke victims or things like that may have trouble if, if the stroke happens during, in this area. Also, um, from young to old, if, if you are affected with a stutter, or a speech impediment like that, that it is originated in the brain and not a mechanical thing with your mouth, um, researchers have found that it is a decrease of blood flow to Broca's area that is causing that stuttering to happen. And specifically music, whether playing an instrument or singing has been shown to greatly improve a person who is suffering from a stutter by allowing them to reach Broca's area in a different way, by building neural pathways from different other areas of the brain to get to the place where you produce speech. Um, there are also uh, students who have, are affected with Asperger's or autism where they are speech delayed. Sometimes you'll find that a, a child with Asperger's or autism may not speak until they are eight, nine, or 10, but they can sing from very, very early. And so by reaching, by using music to reach these different areas of the brain in a different neural pathway, we can help a Alzheimer's patient, a stroke victim, or a, a, a person who is affected by stuttering or um, Asperger's or autism, to be able to communicate clearly. And that kind of changes the game for them be it to, that they can be understood and communicate 
what they need and want and desire and their thoughts and opinions about the world. So the next area that we're going to highlight is Wernicke's area. And if you look over there, it has this beautiful quote that says, we use this part of the brain to analyze and enjoy music. Sometimes we just simply turn on the radio to drive to the grocery store and we're not paying any attention um, or music when you're in the elevator and stuff. And we're not really paying attention to it, but our brain is um, subconsciously. Or then we take a moment and we actually are listening to the music for just pleasure. You know, you're out running and you're listening to the music to help you keep your stride. You're going to be specific on what you pick for your playlist typically. Um, or when you're, I love to listen to music when I work around the house. I'm convinced that I clean better if there's music on. Um, so I'm enjoying it while I'm doing something. Well, this part of the brain activates that area and helps us, you know, you may not be fluent in music theory and we're not talking about ABA format for those of you who are familiar with analyzing music, but you are doing a process of analysis by, you know, listening to the different parts. You pick up on who's playing when, what instruments where, who's singing, what's going on. And this specific area really um, gets in there and it comprehends written and spoken language. So it's really, you can use this to help verbally tying in to um, the Broca area. Um, a lot of children we teach from a young age, we do nursery rhymes mm -hmm. and they're rhymes for a reason. Um, we learn to sing our ABCs or, or do different rhythms. This is where that, that works at is um, analyzing it and it, it will help commit it um, to help you remember those things. And we can do a quick recall uh, analyzing and also uh, and just enjoying. The next area that we're going to talk about is the corpus callosum. Um, this area of the brain enables the left and right hemispheres of the brain to communicate. So you may have heard someone say I'm right-brained or I'm left-brained um, and it is true that your brain is wired um, such that one side is more dominant, but it may be a misconception that if you are right-handed, you are right everything else. Um, right eye dominant, right foot dominant. All of these things are controlled in your brain, but you are wired a possible different 32 different ways. So you could have the right side of your brain dominant, but your left eye could be dominant and your right ear could be dominant and you could be left-handed and your right foot dominant. Um, you could be crisscross all different kinds of ways. And so enabling the left and right side of your brain to communicate and to control all of those dominant areas is extremely important. As a musician, you do have, you want to have your left hand and right hand side communicating all of the time. So I am a piano player in addition to being a singer. And um, we, if I put the uh, neural pathway things on top of my head to map out my brain while I am playing and singing at the same time, my brain looks like a Christmas tree, Rockefeller Center, big giant Christmas tree, because I am connecting the right hand side of my body with the left hand side of my body with the verbal speech patterns of my body, all of those things at the same time. So if you are not a piano player and you don't sing at the same time, maybe your instrument is not one that you can sing and play at the same time, does that mean that your right side and left side of your brain are never gonna communicate with each other? No, you can build this corpus callosum, these communication pathways between both right and left hand side, regardless of the instrument you play or regardless of if you sing. So one way that we have done this in class, uh, my students are familiar with is we keep a beat using our dominant hand, keep a beat, subdivide the beat and, and divide it even more down. So we've got beat, 
beat division and subdivision all the way down. And then we flip and use our non-dominant hand for beat, beat division, and subdivision. So while you're doing that, you are building those pathways from left side to right side. Then we try to throw something else in there, like marching and keeping the beat at the same time, or singing and keeping the beat at the same time. Singing a rhythm here, keeping a different beat here, and keeping this beat subdivision in our feet. All of those things, any way that you can build your non-dominant, strengthen your non-dominant, only serves to also balance it out with your right hand. And when you have your right and left hemisphere communicating together, you are whole brain learning and whole brain communicating. I'd love to tack onto that for the instrumentalist listening. You know, it makes sense and all that connects immediately to your woodwinds, flute and saxophone and clarinet. They're using both hands to percussion, using both hands. Well, I play trumpet. Um, is it work? It is working. Even though one hand is operating the valve, the other hand got responsibilities of its own doing things. But because of the action it takes to play an instrument, and using all these other different muscle areas, it doesn't have to mean it equals two hands on that part. Now, she gave a beautiful example of how it does work, especially with piano, um, but it automatically activates both sides playing any kind of instrument because you have to do um, all this part. So you're not left out if you're a one-handed trumpet. <laughs> um, all right, so we're gonna close up with Wernicke's area, I think that's no, I'm lying to you. I've already talked about that. Let's try nucleus accumbens. Um, and so uh, it talks about, this is, this is big. This is where I really wanted us to focus on right now. This is the biggie for where we are. Look at the picture. It's tiny. It's the tiniest area. Um, well, not necessarily the tiniest area of the brain, but it's so little. Um, and right now, it has a huge role in your life, it can. So this is where we seek pleasure um, and it will release dopamine. This is the area of the brain that can help you feel extreme happiness. Um, and we crave that. Sometimes we don't realize like we're craving happiness, but I don't feel good. I've watched a lot of news recently and the news can be depressing at any time. Uh, even though there are some great news things. Um, I, I've had a rough day at school. Uh, a lot of stuff's going on in my family. I'm just so anxious. I'm so depressed. Well, you feel that, and, and back there in the back of your mind, it's going to do something to make me feel better. Well, if you'll notice over here on the how, it says music increases dopamine in the nucleus accumbens similar to cocaine. And I do want to point out this small area connects to where we wind up with people who reach for illegal substances and drugs or unhealthy habits that they feel can lead toward self-gratification, um, pleasure, or something like that. When we have something that is just as potent as any drug out there, the strongest drug man can make, we already have it. And it's music. Mm -hmm. And what you listen to really can change your mindset. I have different playlists I love to listen to. I have a varied <laughs> variety of music that I, I enjoy. Um, everything from classical to opera to um Panic at the Disco and Metallica. And I have certain things that I reach to when I'm in a certain mood. And recently I've realized I needed to take a step back. I was really struggling. It was the first week we had all been sent home to, to be at home from school and work. And I was stressed out. I'm a mom. I'm a teacher. I need to be two teachers at once and, and trying to do all this. Plus also be a wife and take care of the home. And, and do stuff with my family. Um, and I realized I was listening to stuff that was just making me almost angrier and frustrated. 
-hmm. And I took a step back and I thought, I need to listen to something different. You know better. You, I knew about this area. I knew how it could work. And you may listen to one song and be like, it's not helping. I'm not happy yet. I don't want to. Okay. Yeah. Keep going. Keep trying. Think of a song that you haven't listened to in a long time, or maybe it's your favorite song on the radio right now. And it doesn't mean it has to be happy. Um, although Pharrell's happy is pretty great. And it's a number one recommended song to get you up moving and perk up your attitude. Um, but it can just be a song you really enjoy. Ironically, one of my favorite songs to listen to is March Slaw by Tchaikovsky. And it has a very dark story behind it. And it is not what one would typically call happy. Um, but I get so much enjoyment out of just being still and listening to it. And, and that's where you need to go. So maybe you go to church and you've not been able to sing your favorite hymn. Sing it. Um, maybe you're an instrumental player. Go to Google. You can find hymn songs on Google. Play your favorite hymn if you don't want to sing. Turn on the radio. Pull out your C dusty CD stack for those of you who still have some of those decrepit things. Some of us still have some cassette tapes. <laughs> and I have my grandmother's records. So I got a big old variety to dig into. Um, and you can really find some things that can give you a lot of pleasure and distract you from the everyday stresses of life. I think that's really important. And I think that what Mrs. Chance is saying about finding healthy ways, that, that's the key there. Playing your instrument, singing the songs, dancing it out, you know, finding healthy ways to boost that natural dopamine that our brains were designed. We are designed to feel happiness and sadness, but we're not meant to spend all of the time in sadness or all of the time in happiness. Both of those are important, just like the sound and the rest. They're both equally important to a piece of music. And the happiness and the sadness, feel your feelings but don't let them drive. That's, that's the thing is you, you feel all of the things, but know that part of this is your brain responding to the things around you. And you can influence how you feel based on what you put in your eyes and your ears. So I hope that you have enjoyed our little co-teaching talk about how the brain responds to music. We don't get to do these kind of co-teaching things very often, but now that we know how to use, you know, the Zoom, we can, we may can do this again in the future, even when hopefully we're not going to be under quarantine forever. We both miss our students so much and we would love, we would love to go back to school and see them. But until then, you're gonna see us on Google Classroom and Zoom and on all our social media accounts. And so I hope that you listen to this talk and that sparks some desire to learn more about how the brain responds to music. You can see we only covered four areas and there's a whole list over here. Um, and understanding what the brain does uh, for your body is incredible and how music feeds into that is just, we could nerd out all day if we wanted to. Yeah. So thank you so much for watching. We are so glad um, to see you, um, even if it is virtually. And we uh, may be coming back next in a week or two about maybe after spring break with another co-teaching choir and band lesson. I dig it. <laughs> Bye.